Just a friendly reminder that the opinions expressed on this show are not worth a Canadian penny, so disregard anything you hear that might get anyone in trouble. And despite some of the great ideas you may hear, don't try them at home. Go to friend's house instead. It's time to get a gun. That's what I've been thinking. Well, I could afford one. And if I did just a little less drinking, time to put something between me and the sun. Hello and welcome to episode 289 of Slam Fire Radio for January 31st, 2019. I'm one of your hosts, Adriel. I'm the other one, Trevor, because everyone else is gone. They just, there was a polar vortex or something out east. You guys had, it was so cold. It was almost minus 20 or 30. <laughs> <laughs> it was minus 39 in Winnipeg today. Shut down the place. That's Every time I see Tracy complain about Ottawa's winter on Facebook, I'm like, bitch, please. Not like, <laughs> and, I, and I post a picture of my front yard. <laughs> They're like minus 30. What's the temperature in, in Ottawa right now? Minus 30? I don't know, but it's, it's cold. <laughs> But it'll be plug in your car. Yeah. It'll be plus five tomorrow. So stop it. Yeah. 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 And that's what's holding back uh, Matthew and Kelly tonight is uh, frozen. Yeah. Kelly's fr- Kelly actually did that thing that you were told not to do as a child. And she put her tongue on a telephone or a uh, flagpole. She's still there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kevin is making her meals in a blender and she's eating them with, through a straw. So. Yeah, Matthew's frozen to his airplane. He was trying yep. to repair it. Yeah. It was yeah. also get cold. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to tell us about uh, what we did in Guns this week? Brought Absolutely. to you by the Calgary Shooting Center? Yeah. So, as you said, what we did this week in Guns is brought to us by the Calgary Shooting Center, Canada's premier firearms retailer. And this week, they have the Geisley Super 700 trigger for $337. This is a Remington 700 trigger made by Geisley. And the list of features, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm going to go through them because it's unbelievable. You pull and the trigger and it shoots a bullet. Basically, I guess you summed it up and we can move on. You're a jerk. But... <laughs> Uh, $337 is on par with other match triggers for this platform, but they don't have these features. Check this out. A uh, revolutionary drop-in trigger upgrade for the 700 series of rifles that provides a shooter with an unprecedented level of adjustability. And that is really more than anything what this thing brings. Uh, it can be set for single action, uh, single stage, or two-stage pull. The total weight can be adjusted for 12 ounces. <laughs> <laughs> from 12 ounces all the way up to a whopping three and a half pounds. Uh, it comes from the factory set to two and a half pounds. You'll probably never, Reasonable. never change. Yeah. You'll Reasonable. probably never change it from there. Two separate sears for two stage operation, not a fake first stage, just from spring pressure. It actually has legit two stages with two sears. Over travel is adjustable. Triple redundant safety safety mechanism, machined, honed, and polished from aerospace grade alloys. Ooh, space trigger. Um, yeah, and you and it's, it's coated. The trigger itself looks like the same trigger that you see on their AR triggers that have the G on the trigger shoe. Just really, really sweet. So, uh, if you're looking to upgrade your 700 trigger, I mean, who does a better trigger than Geisley? I know you're a fan of set triggers. I love Geisleys. I've had many Geisleys. I'm on my fourth Geisley, um, and they're they're the best. I had a problem with a Geisley once, and they actually had their tech guy phone me from Europe because he was on a trip in Europe, and he's like, we're going to get this guy to call you. He's in Europe, but he's going to find the time to call you. I'm like, holy <laughs> smokes. And we, and we spoke, and he's like, super semi-auto, eh? Well, sir, I can't tell you how many rounds it takes to wear one out because we've still not worn one out. Hmm. Okay. So anyway, turned out it was the gun. I dropped the trigger into another uh, lower of correct tolerances. And what do you know? Never look back. Never had a problem. Hmm. So, yep. Um, yeah. So check them out. The Calgary Shooting Center. Very cool. Did you want to continue on with uh, what you did in guns? Sure. Um, Gallon was up for the weekend. He came up to uh, pick up a couple of guns. One he bought for me. One that uh, DC Armory did an amazing job refinishing. Gallon now owns Canada's most expensive Lama 1911. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, he had it seracoded. 
He had plates welded into the frame so that he could uh, mount mag pull grips to it. He had the slide cut or milled for um, night sights. He had it Cerakoted. I think I said that already, Cerakoted. Oh, he had the uh, dust cover drilled and tapped for an accessory rail. <laughs> it's just, uh, any, uh, you know, I'm not going to say what he paid for the gun, but he may have paid four times, four and a half times more for the work than he did for the gun. That's, I'll say that. That's, yeah, that I can say. Um, but he's super happy with it. And he's super happy with the work. So that's all that matters. Uh, and then we took my WK out for a drive in the woods um, to do a little pew pew with that because he's quite interested in that platform. So we took it out so he could try it. And he's uh, even more interested now that he's had hands on and shot a little bit. However, we did get two malfunctions. Um, go, oh, and I rectified a malfunction. Remember I asked you about over inserting mags? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out it was just that brand of mag. And I believe it's the mag that came with the gun. No. No, it was those um, full-length LAR mix. They were the ones ah. I was able to over over insert. Um, other mags do not over insert, so no big deal then. Not a gun problem, mag problem. So speaking of mags, I uh, filled up a bunch of my five-round mags, um, and the gun malfunctioned with two different P mags. And the malfunction was uh, seated the mag, chambered around, pulled the trigger, round fired, bolt locked back. So something is engaging the. Um, bolt stop for some reason not yeah. sure why only happened on those two p mags so um which is kind of a problem because when i take the gun into the bush i'm going to do it with five round mags uh i'm gonna you know you and i discussed this on the patreon episode i don't want to have to go down the road of explaining this is a non-restricted mag and yes i'm allowed to have this pistol mag in it we all saw that video in bc where a guy had his xtr taken away and the lar mag taken away and the um officer's opinion was yes you're allowed to have the gun yes you're allowed to have the mag but you can't put that mag with that gun i was like whatever you got it all back anyway but you know i watched uh, another video of uh of some cops doing some, a check stop or there was a, some shooting area in bc that they were doing a check at and they were talking oh, about um, uh, all the laws that uh yeah. they had to follow I had that, that was all like wrong. 80 percent correct i would say yeah. 80 well, 80 okay, percent right and 20 percent like wrong is this and, the one uh, where a guy had a mag fed pump action shotgun. Yeah. He laid the mag on the tailgate of the truck and then stacked a bunch of empties on the mag. Yeah. Saying that it could hold more than it was supposed to. Uh, one, you didn't account for the spring and follower. Two, there's no magazine capacity in a bolt action or a pump action pump. firearm in Canada. Yep. Douche. Yep. That was the one. Yeah. And again, uh, like we, we've mentioned this a couple of times on the, on the podcast. Uh, our, our laws are, are too complicated for a, uh, uh, officer to reasonably remember and enforce they're they're too complicated i mean and that's with a pretty simplified uh, uh magazine uh, laws our magazines are based on what they're designed for it should the magazine is for a pump action it should be easy to follow and the problem with that adriel is it goes out into the mainstream media unchecked the person doing the interview assumes that the dnr officer understands firearms laws because he encounters firearms every day in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, the people watching the video also then assume, hey, he's got a badge and a uniform and a stripe on his pants. He must be an authority. He must know what he's talking about. Wrong. It gets sure out there. Like because... he does. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Carry a clipboard and a pen and look busy and you can get in anywhere. Mm -hmm. So um, what else? Oh, I did some, uh, along with Gallon, other, other gunnies came over, uh, Snuffleupagus came over, other Trevor came over, Mini-Me came over, not Filthy Son, the other Mini-Me, Paul Lombard, and, uh, we put together an AR-15 for Paul Lombard, so that was a lot of fun. Um, what else? Oh, um, I may have mentioned this in the past. The Canadian Coalition for Firearms Rights is going to be developing a range safety officer program uh, not unlike the NFA's program. And I say that because it's being developed by the same guy who developed the NFA's program. It's his program and he lets pro gun orgs, um, you know, use it after you uh, work out some details and whatnot. So we will be putting on an instructor, a teach the teacher type course this spring. So uh, I was working on that. Um, Is it going to be for any particular events or just running a range? Or... It's a, it's a, a, like a rifle range officer, firing line range officer 
certification program. So you're going to learn about range standards, range commands, how to clear firearms, um, that sort of thing. So, you know, like, so I was at Chaz one day, right? And uh, guests are not allowed to shoot without a range officer. So I would assume it would be, the, you know, the range officer would be somebody who's taken this kind of course. Here in New Brunswick, the Royal, Royal New Brunswick Rifle Association has a range officer certification program. Uh, I took that. The NFA has the program. It took that. And now the CCFR is going to have their own. And for some clubs, it's important to have a range officer certification program provided to you by the same people you buy your insurance from. Uh, why that is, I don't know. But CCFR does sell insurance. So for those clubs that are maybe holding out saying, yeah, we'd like to switch, but we need to be, we need to have trained range officers by the same people that sell us our insurance. Well, we'll be able to meet that need. So. Is that like a club person who likes to check the boxes and make sure that the boxes like line up kind of a thing, not like a strict requirement? Doesn't sound like a strict requirement. It doesn't sound like a strict requirement. Um, well, it's not a requirement by the by the uh, insurance CFO or anything like that. Now, that being said, in Quebec, you're only allowed to shoot on a range anywhere in Quebec when a range officer is present. And the curriculum that those range officers have undergone had to have been approved by the province of Quebec. Hmm. So not some, just... some, some ranges say like the first person on a, on a bay is now the range officer for that bay. Yep. Um, yeah. That's an, that's a, a written rule in many clubs, but it doesn't talk to, as to whether or not that person must be an actual range officer. Like certified so, in any right. Way. Yeah. Right. Now in Quebec, that is the case. They have to be a certified, recognized range officer. The certification that they took has to be recognized by the province. Hmm. At my club, just as you described, if you and I and Matthew are shooting, one of us becomes a range officer. When one of us needs to check our targets, then we call the line clear, and it's either your job, my job, or Matthew's job to flick flags around, turn lights around, verify that firearms have been cleared appropriately and that shooters are stepping off the line and going behind the waiting line. So that's but that person doesn't need any official training other than somebody pointing out what his roles are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now our trap section, the coordinators there are actual certified range officers and our kids program, the people who run it and the volunteers are actual certified range officers, especially with the kids program. We look upon that as going above and beyond to do our due diligence to ensure that the children are being supervised by people who understand range rules and range safety. If ever there's an accident, we can say, hey, look, it's unfortunate. However, we didn't just let anybody on the line with these kids. We let certified range officers on there. You know, we were going, we were doing everything we could to ensure that the event was run in a safe way. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And then I did a lot more brass prep. I'm, I've got another thousand, uh, two, two, three bullets, uh, of, they're at the post office right now. I just didn't have time to go get them. So I've got to prep some brass. So, um, I set my Dylan up and clean with the swage it cleaned a bunch of military IVI brass that had never been resized before. It was all once fired and it all had crimp primer pockets. So I lubed, I cleaned it, lubed it, and then put it in the case feeder. It goes down first station. It resizes in my RCBS undersized die, which is also an X die, but I removed the X die component, but it is getting undersized. And in the next station where I would normally see the pr uh, primer, I'm um, swaging the primer pocket. So I did probably over a thousand and um, it's, it's not the pushing the brass onto the swager that puts pressure on the, on the, on the, on the uh, press. It's when you pull back on the handle to remove the brass from the swager, that's when it can be quite sticky. So I yeah. keep the, yeah. I keep the cutter, the swage device itself um, lubricated with either a little bit of squirt of ballast all or some Lee case lube. And um, it's still, and then the machine itself needs to be tightened often. Uh, I took an Allen key that uh, had a little bit of wear on it. I chopped it with a cutting wheel on my Dremel to make sure that it was 100% sharp and clean and ready to go. And mm -hmm. one of the screws is still really soft metal and starting to let go. So lock washers, they still loosen up. I've got to get better screws. I think I might use a dab of blue Loctite. What the heck? It is removable after all. So 
uh, because uh, every couple of hundred, I look down and I'm, I'm tightening that thing, the swage it tool itself. If you forget to tighten it, you'll know because it'll start to rub on the plastic container where the spent primers go. And that's like, oh, that, that's a new sound. I didn't hear that before. Sure mm-hmm. enough, check it. It's loose. Tighten it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the brass then goes to over to the drill press where I've got my world's finest trimmer and I've got a drill in the vise, just a regular cordless drill in the vise with my primer pocket uniforming tool. So I uniform the primer pocket, put it in the world's finest trimmer and then chamfer and deburr and check it with my calipers. And if it is because the world's finest trimmer, unfortunately will not trim them all because they, uh, don't all bounce back at the same rate when they come out of the die. So the shoulder is necessarily in the same place on all of them, even within the same head stamp. I'll have IVI that'll work perfect. I'll have uh, Norinco brass that'll work perfect. I'll have Norinco brass and our, our IVI brass that won't work perfect. And by I say hmm. work perfect, what I mean by that is when I remove from the trimmer, it's uh, trimmed to length or it's not even within the same head stamp. So if it is trimmed to length and correct, then I'll deburr the flash hole and I'll throw it in one bucket. And if it's too long, I'll throw it in the other bucket. And then, so the bucket bucket that's too long, uh, Snuffy's coming over this weekend to reload some 223. Well, guess what? That's his 223 <laughs> press because he's not nearly as picky as I am. It's all trimmed mm-hmm. to the same length, but it's not trimmed to the length I want. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's still fine. If I was going to keep that brass, then I would use my bench top mounted brass trimmer, which um, doesn't rely on the shoulder to gauge the distance, the length of the brass. But it's it, slow as heck compared to It is to slow as heck. It's finest. slower. What's really slow about this, uh, it's incredibly precise. It's arguably the most precise brass trimmer there is. Um, it actually has a uh, one of those uh, gauges there, a uh, micrometer built right into it. Um, but it measures right at the, at the back of the head stamp to the neck of the case, the mouth of the case. So there's no way that it won't then go into the caliper and be the size you want. So then I uh, did some more nine mil reloading uh, before all this actually. Um, but then I've got, somebody gave me a bucket of IVI nine mil brass. So it also has a crimp primer pocket. Well, the suede it works so much better on this and captain Andy, huge shout to him. He gave me a tip. I'm finding that nine millimeter is really difficult. To, well, difficult. I mean, that's a relative term, but compared to other pistol caliber, uh, pistol calibers going through the Dillon 650, nine mil is the most difficult to resize. It's a tapered case. It's stiff. It doesn't go into the resizing die like 40 or like 45, 45 is the best there is to reload on a 650, um, that I've done so far. So uh, I don't want to lube my nine mil cases because then I don't want to have lubricated ammo kicking around. It's going to get sticky and then dust and dirt and all that stuff sticks to it, right? Well, I got a new media separator from um, Frank uh, Frankfurt Arsenal, and it's a wet or dry media separator. It has a lid on it. So what you do is you put water in the bottom, put your brass, you take your your uh, wet your wet tumbler that is cleaned with stainless steel pins and it's a pain in the butt to separate the pins from the brass cases. I used to go in by hand and pull the brass out of the water one at a time. And the water would suck the brass pins, right? Really time consuming. So Andy said, well, uh, I got a wet separator. So he just takes the contents of his wet tumbler, pours it into the basket, closes the basket, puts the lid on. And when you start turning the basket, what's happening is the brass is going through the water in the bottom of the separator and that water is pulling the pins out every time you rotate it so the water is sucking the pins out for you and it's got a lid on top so you're not splashing all over your laundry room this is so much better than dry tumbling i cannot tell you because dry tumbling i think is one of the uh, leading sources of my lead contamination the dust in that media is toxic and filthy and when i first got into reloading i used to separate the media from the brass in my workroom and all of a sudden one day i I noticed on top of everything in that workroom there was a thin layer of like black soot and i don't have an oil furnace so there's nothing burning in my house there's no there's no reason for this black dust on everything right it was the media separator the dust was going in the eye wasn't wearing a ventilator or nothing so when i left that house and moved to this house i started to separate the, the dry media from the brass outside because I've got a, a, an exit in the basement just goes right over underneath the back patio and I would wear a little dust mask and I'd do it outside. Still, man, you got to deal with that heavy it's, oh, pain. So now you take the contents of your wet 
tumbler. You pour it into this basket, all the water. Well, no, you rinse it once. And then, so now it's empty of water. You pour the brass and the pins into this media separator, put the lid on and you stir it. Now here's the Captain Andy trick. Put three shots of ballastol in the water, separate the media and the pins. And that little bit of ballastol that's in the water creates a, uh, unperceivable layer of ballastol on your cases. All of a sudden they go through the press like a lubricated case, but you Mm. don't even feel it on the brass. Uh, And so I was concerned about contamination, right? He's like, Nope, I've been doing it for tens of thousands of rounds of 45 and I've not had any contaminated powder or primer yet. So I just sent a message today in our group Facebook conversation. You are a genius. It really made a significant difference resizing it. So, so then I've got that bucket of IV, IVI nine millimeter brass with crimp primer pockets. I threw it in my wet tumbler just for a couple of hours. You know, it was already decapped because I had to, I decapped it all in the universal um, decapping die. And then I was going to, chamfer these or not uh, i was going to ream these primer pockets with a hand tool just the cutter in the press in the drill press and just hold them on and zip 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 and oh my god no no it was it was i was going to throw the brass away it wasn't worth the, the time and the effort but now take that brass that just went through the wet tumbler it's got a thin layer of ballastol on it throw it in the case feeder and resize it and then use the swage it in the primer section so now i'm going to go through that entire bucket of brass in like an hour there's oh, nice there's, yeah oh yeah just cr- you're just constantly cranking you're not when you're loading ammo in the 650 every 100 rounds you have to stop and refill the primers you're you know you crank it you place a bullet on the case you crank the handle you place a bullet on the case with this operation every time i'm just cranking the handle and the brass just keeps as long as my case feeder is full uh, and now i have resized brass with clean primer pockets because they went through the um, the wet tumbler and the primer pockets are swaging lickety split. Like uh, now that I have this Arsenal wet media separator, I'm never going back, never going back to dry. Never. I mean, yeah, well, it, I mean, what do you do in the winter? Like, you can't go separate outside when there's like a, a meter of snow out, out, uh, out the I mean, back. I can, I can because it's, it's enclosed underneath my patio. Oh, I see. but if I, if I couldn't, oh my God, what would I do? because I don't want that dust in our home. And I'm, where am I going to go out on the street? Like it's, it's ridiculous. If you live in an apartment, like it's ridiculous. You obviously can't do this in an apartment. So, oh yeah, get yourself a wet stainless steel tumbler and get a wet media separator and uh, never look back. So, um, and I mean, I'm going to wear out my Thumbler tumbler because it's been going almost 24 hours a day for batch after batch brass that it was already clean. I'm putting it through this thing um, more just to get that, that ballast all on it. So, mm-hmm. um, and then I received a package today from uh, the gun vault. So it wasn't supposed to be a package. That's the really cool thing. A while back I was, uh, I don't know. I think I, I don't know if I saw this on, uh, gun vaults website or gun vaults instagram probably instagram i saw this really amazing t-shirt and you know i just had to have it so on the front of the t-shirt it has a white silhouette of an m1 garand it's a black t-shirt with a white silhouette of an m1 grand and can you guess what it says on the back well, yeah because you, you said it earlier play along <laughs> uh it says uh wrong well, it says get, get off, off my lawn, my lawn. So if you're a Clint Eastwood fan like I am, go Dirty Harry, and you saw the movie Gran Torino, uh, you'll get that reference. So he goes out on the lawn with his M1 Garand that he took home from the Korean War and points at some gangbangers and says, get off my lawn. That's kind of been my mantra because I'm a cranky old man, and I have two Garands. So it won't be long before I post a picture of this shirt with the two Garands and post that all over Instagram and give the gun vault a shout-out. So um, here's why it was a package. I ordered the shirt a long time ago and it never arrived. So I sent an email and asked, uh, has my shirt shipped yet? And he was like, call me. He's like, what do you mean? You don't have your shirt. I sent it like forever ago. Uh, I'm sorry, dude. I I never got my shirt. So he's like, all right, next batch. I will make sure you get a shirt. So not only did I get a shirt, I got a little note saying, thank you for your patience. I got an awesome steel, um, water bottle type, type or, you know, container, probably water or coffee. I'm going to use it for water. Mm-hmm. And he gave me two awesome uh, gun vault stickers. 
Cool. So I think, you know, my old gun room used to have gun safes in it and the gun safes are completely covered in stickers. And now the gun safes are all gone because I sold them. So I'm going to start the back of the door. I think I'll start doing stickers on the back of the door of the new gun room. So, and uh, one there and one on a gun case, of course. So, mm-hmm. so shout out to the gun vault. Thank you for hooking me up. I had no problem waiting. You did not have to uh, do that for me. I, I don't even know if he listens. I think he knew who I was. He he didn't just like um, sound like he was talking to somebody who uh, some random dude that made an order. I don't could know. just like have might... a keen eye for customer service. Some people could are be. Open. Could... Oh yeah, I'm sure that's yeah. the case. I'm sure he yeah. didn't do this because it's because no, I didn't want to. <laughs> don't make no. But you were you were kind of suggesting that? Oh, yeah. that he knows really... who you are. Of course, no, no he does. it's just. It was just so friendly the way he was talking to me. He was talking to me like, you know what I mean? Um, I was, I thought he was going to ask me about Steve. Like, he was like, hey, man, how you been? Stuff like that. Anyway, anyway, like you said, though, he could talk to everybody like that. Um, so, yeah, it was awesome. How's about you, man? What have you been up to now that I've taken like four hours? <laughs> <laughs> and I have uh, a guest, I have a guest waiting to reload 22250. So I was in my mind, I was like, all right, do this quick because we got stuff to do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's get to reloading. To, I don't have twenty two fifty. Uh, I got a, a shadow two. That's you do like, yeah. It's a black one now. Oh, I'm very enjoying this. I uh, look at that. I didn't think I would care, but I really like the black grips. I mm-hmm. really like the look of this thing now. Um, and I'm not really one for looks on guns. Like I, I think that ugly guns are fine, but I really like the black up the black grips on there. Yeah, I mean these are nice. But yours are nicer. Yeah, mine and are the mag, like a the magwell on it. Yeah, yeah, makes it look meaner, and Big I time. love the feel of it because it's uh, one of the things I like about the magwell on my Glock is that it squeezes my three yep. fingers uh, uh, that are kind Same of pressing every between. time. Yeah, nowhere yeah. else to go but home. Yeah, so you you grab that gun in, in the holster, and when you grip it, just by just gripping it, your your fingers mm-hmm. are going to center and, and kind of squeeze it shut there. So. Um, this is uh, one of the sets of parts on it. Did I talk about the trigger last time? I don't think I did. I don't think so. You may have uh, ordered the parts or you ordered them right after mm-hmm. last week. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I ordered everything. I'd be like, yeah, I want to pimp out a shout out too. Give me everything. Give me what you got. <laughs> and uh, I got the uh, the short reset trigger on there. The The short di- uh, reset disconnector, I think, makes like the most difference out of this. Because now that your single stage is so short, the the take up on it is uh, it probably uh, fifty to sixty percent reduced, so and quite a bit less take up. Not that it really matters. The trigger oh, yeah, pull matters. is is totally uh, a lot crisper, so the the hammer has uh, a much better polished sear area, and the let off where it grabs onto the sear is tiny. There's just a tiny little shelf there, and all the sear needs to move is move like a tiny bit, and it's off that shelf. So the actual creep on there is uh, is less as well, if not any. And then between the between that better um, uh, surface on the hammer, that's a little bit more polished and a little bit uh, less of a, a surface, and the changed out springs on this thing, uh, the trigger pull has lost uh, about a pound or a little bit more than that uh, on the single and double action. Um, so a that's pa- neat. A pound yeah. on the single. Yeah, because it's right around two and a half, two point six, two point seven, somewhere around there. Oh, on, so almost as good as a nineteen eleven. Yep. Um, and the good news and heavier there, and still a, a lot heavier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, you may or may not know this. I'll put it out there for the benefit of the listeners. Even though you changed all those trigger parts, it's still production legal. The only thing you got to do is swap that guy. Right. The only thing left to do if you want to run it in Ipsic is remove the magwell. That's quite easy. Well, so uh, the magwell and the grips, because the magwell on here, I don't know why they did this when they decided to do the magwell. Why do the grips and the magwell have to change? I don't feel like they really should. Yeah, the, the grips are actually shorter. And this is just how magwells work in, on, the, yeah. on the CZ-75s, is that the uh, the grips are about half, not half, they're cut off right there. Yep. Whereas on the other one, they go down another inch. No, not even three quarters of an inch. And these grips are so expensive. They're like they're like a hundred bucks if you're going to buy the grips. Delask has the magwell grips and the couple of base pads for 250 and that's the cheapest you'll find in the country right now delask has cz grips 
cheaper than some places have them for cost price. I don't know how they're doing it, where they're getting them, but the Lask is one of the best places to buy CZ grips. No, it is the best place that I found in Canada. Yeah. Uh, so just like uh, the other thing I got was uh, uh, some base pads. So I got some of these, uh, or these double tap. Double Tap Sports is making them. Base pads are somewhere in the $25 to $50 range for base pads, right? These are $25. $25 bucks a pop. So that's about as cheap as I could get. I asked the last uh, if I could get more of these ones, and they they never respond to any of my emails. I bought some stuff, and it showed up here, but they like do not respond to emails. Because I asked, like, hey, I wouldn't mind just getting like five of these things, and then I'll be good to go. Mm. No, so, no response no. for you. No. Um, so I got some of these. Uh, I got five of these uh, Double Tap Sports ones from uh, from Double Tap. Uh, the yeah, nice Yasko piece. makes nice stuff. These safeties, all my 1911s have, except for my new ones, because I just haven't gotten them yet. These safeties here, these extended ambidextrous safeties, yeah. says right on there, Double Taps, he makes those. Nice. Yeah. He makes comps. He actually has a line of parts. Yeah. It's quite good. Very reasonably priced, at least. Well, like you can't, you cannot get cheaper than this for that for base pads than for twenty five bucks. No. no, no. Um, and they add twenty percent more weight compared to the uh, plastic ones, which is not supposed to be a thing in Ipsic, but it's kind of a thing. It's totally kind of a, a thing. thing. And a since bit the lighter. production, yeah, since in production yeah. you can use aftermarket base pads, you can use aftermarket mags, and the gun doesn't have to fit in the box. You can have some big serious aluminum bumpers on there or solid brass ones. Have you seen those? Yeah, the, um, what's his name? Stoger's uh, yep. got them on his website, and uh, they're pricey. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I used to use brass ones on my Glock. Ooh, Nelly. Yeah. Um, so now with these, uh, the uh, double tap ones poke out a little bit over the uh, magwell, so that's good. The uh, the ones it comes with are a little bit more flush fitting in there. Like they still bump out just a little bit, but not quite as much. And the factory ones, well, they don't work anymore. The, the factory ones won't <laughs> no. actually uh, lock in now. So uh, you have to use base pads with this. But that's okay, because that's the whole idea is if I'm going to shoot three gun, it's going to be with the 40 cal Mechar mags and with a mag well. And that's uh, that's all I need to do. Good to go. Yeah, so that was the shadow. I got, uh, I got some new video lights. Uh, they look kind of like that. That's and why you're like, extra white tonight. Uh, well, it, it's winter, and uh, this is this is what happens in winter. But also, I got some more lights. <laughs> Normally, uh, I just I've have seen you. In, the... I've seen you in July. You're not exactly a shade darker. I am a little bit darker. Come on, come on. A little, not but, a full uh, shade. Yeah, this is uh, this is just with these lights right now. And I think I have my like forty percent. So they're they're a nice fill, and uh, I've got them so I can aim them at my table, so I can do some more table stops and stuff. Because this year I want to do more restricted firearms stuff. I see a lot of uh, a lot of the Which pistol is... reviews is just people shooting at a range, people shooting steel. It's like, yeah, the gun works. Thank you very much. Tell like show me some in depth stuff about this pistol, and I I never get it from those kind of guys. And yeah, and you know what I like about your channel? Uh, you don't talk about your kids or your wife or your job or the commute to work. It's like, I'm here to talk about this gun now. And that's what we start talking about right away. And that's and, all I want. And sometimes I'll uh, I'll make sure there's no bullet in it. And that's it. That's, yeah. <laughs> and people get cheesed about that. But, you know, whatever. I don't care. Ah, you know, like that. My I've I've gone back and forth on that. Whether I show, like, of course, I clear it before the video. But the whole point of showing it on the video is, hey, if there's someone like watching this thing right now, you should you should clear your gun too. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's that's all I'm trying to do there. Anyways, I got all that stuff set up, so I should be able to do some more videos. It should be easier and uh, better quality. Um, I am. Oh man, I'm getting like way more wrapped into this than I thought I would be. This is like this was a big surprise for me. I signed up for this uh, CRPS match, and I was like just gonna grab some 22 rifle out of the closet and uh, <laughs> uh, and head on out there and shoot it. And uh, I'm getting wrapped into it. I'm getting wrapped into it big time. I didn't even really see the allure before. Like we had Rick on, and he's talking about it. I'm like, man, this sounds like so boring. Like max round limit, uh, shooting 22s. Like, pff, what's where's the allure to this? Um, but I'm, I'm getting Matthew. it. Matthew should be all over this. Matthew should be all over this because this is actually like right, like right up his alley. And like, I don't know, it's, it's kind of harkening back to like, um, 
not stunt shooting, but like, can you shoot that thing way over there with your 22? It kind of feels like that a little bit. I've been watching, um, they, they have a, a similar kind of thing in the States called NRL 22, where it's like 22 rimfire precision shooting. You shoot at various distances. They don't go very far in that, but uh, they shoot like pretty, pretty precise targets. And uh, yeah, I'm into it. I'm, 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 uh, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, the why? thing is like, what, I has, could... what has tickled your, your fancy here? I think I could set this up at my parents' place. I think I could set this up at my buddy's place. I think like this would be super easy oh, to do. I look at all a, these a, a firearm sport you could do on the back forty. Yeah, yeah. And the props is like mild steel. Oh, that's fine. Yep, twenty. You're not going to hurt it with twenty two. Yeah. Nope. Uh, whereas all the other stuff, like you got to buy expensive AR five hundred. Nah, just just a, a plate thinner the better because then it'll move when you shoot the thing too, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, make sure that your buddy understands that not all steels created equal. And when he asks, "Can I shoot your plate?" Say yes, but not with your two two three, Trevor, or with your SKS. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah. I put, a, it. I put a round dead center through one of McClatchy's twenty two gongs. Oh, <laughs> oops. Yeah, yeah. So I'm 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 in I'm into it. I'm 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 definitely looking forward to it. I've been looking through my ammo. Like uh, I like. I have a lot of 22 ammo. I've probably got, I don't know, 10,000 rounds somewhere around there. Um, almost all of it's high velocity and you need standard velocity for shooting long range because you don't want to like go through that transonic thing. So now I got to go, uh, go to the range. I, I got to, this is like an important thing. I have to go to the range and try out a bunch of standard velocity ammo and, and then order based off that. Right. Did you track down any SK standard? I have SK standard, SK match, CCI standard velocity, some Ely, uh, some federal match. Yeah, playing around, dude. That was just what I had on hand. That's oh all God. I have for standard velocity. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but oh, uh, wow. I kind of hope it likes the standard velocity because the standard velocity stuff. Here, I got some pricing on this stuff. Standard velocity, if you buy it by the 5,000, 7.4 cents each. Uh, and it goes up from there. There's some SK standard plus that I could get for right around 14 cents each, but that's like twice the price. And then once you get into like some of your more fancier ones, you're like 18, 20 cents each and up. So we carry, we carry a lot of SK. Well, we got a, a fair amount of Ely on hand as well, but we got a lot of SK at the shop. There's a really active biathlon club. Mm -hmm. So SK is great practice ammo for them. I My rifle really likes the SK match, but I really hope that the, standard velocity is just as good because it's yeah of course or less than half the price <laughs> yeah so when you say your rifle you're referring to that nork maple seed killer yeah the nork maple seed killer and <sighs> i've been i've been doing some work to it oh my god can you imagine like you're gonna tune that up make it better well i'm not like the the accuracy is already like i i, I can't do anything there um, well if you bet the I, stock i the stock is bedded oh dang it Yes, I have bedded the stock. I've put a, a crazy trigger in here. This is a uh, like a, a honed surface light trigger uh, spring you were able on it. To replace the trigger on a Nork. Well, there's some parts you can put in there to yeah yeah like CZ parts or no 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 more DIY than that. A lot more DIY than that. All but, right. Uh, yeah, anyways, the, the trigger on this thing is uh, a pound and uh, it's very sharp. So with the work I've done is uh, I popped on a rail up at the front here, just a little bit of pick rail. Uh, this has also got a QD slot in it, so I can uh, uh, pop in a maple seed uh, sling. I've also got this, this, this these guys here. Maple seed, yeah. Nah, I'm going QD. I, like, I, I, I get the whole, like, uh, what, do they call, what do they call these sling stud uh, connections anyways? The sl I, some, sling swivels? Sling swivels and the sling, yeah. the regular rifles. They QD? They're kind not of. as quick as the one of these guys uh, sorry podcast listeners the qd uh push button ones yeah, are quicker, yeah right? legit this QD. is the, yeah this that's is the way to roll yeah. because let's say you're in a match and you're like now i want to put my sling in and you just right. stick that guy in there and now you've got a sling right so you know what then i i i owe the other trevor an apology because he ordered a setup like that i'm like oh you didn't need all that and there's uncle mike's canadian tire if he bought what you got rolling right there then i'm gonna eat some crow because mm -hmm. that I, I i i'm convinced now and that's hard to beat yeah, and then I did the same thing at the back. I got a naturally e mount right there, so now I can pop that sling on or off really quick. Um, yeah. I actually found that when I have this thing uh, uh, 
set up for a hasty. It's also pretty well set up for the cinching up on your arm there. So uh, mm. pretty good. I think I'm, I think I'm good to go on both of those. I need to get a different uh, cheek rest. Mm-hmm. Um, and then for the, I've got the, my big bad, uh, Citron on here right now, and I'm going to leave it on there because yes, it's, do. uh, it's got really good adjustability on it. The, uh, uh clicks, uh, are, are very nice. It's very easy to dial it in for, for long range. And it's got a lot of, I think it's got 80 MOA of adjustment, 40 up and down. So lots of adjustment. Um, my rings are the Burris Z signature rings, which have those little plastic inserts. Uh, this, uh, because it's a 30 mil, um, that you should be able to get 20 MOA out of it, but because they're, they're so close out of necessity, I, I, I had to right, mount the, uh, the rings yeah. close to each other. You're I actually get more, full... more. Yeah. Now I'm getting, I'm getting tw- I, it, by, by the chart, I'm getting 27 MOA using these rings in the way that I've got them configured. Wow. So dude, that should handle me 27 MOA. Plus I got 40 out of the scope. I should be able to do like 350, 400. That's tight. But I, I only have two five round mags for these things, and finding mags for the NS522 is horrible. If we Will have any it... listeners that have the Scorpio 322 mags and would sell one to me or sell two to me, I want them because I need a 10 round mag to be able to shoot like a CRPS and that kind of thing. Well, it's a CZ clone. Is it clone enough? No, no not. it's not a it's not a CZ clone, it's an N shoots 54 clone. And oh, the mags my bad. uses are uh are a little bit off. There's actually a CZ clone that we'll talk about a little bit later on. That's uh, that's kind of interesting. I so the the Scorpio mags fit the Scorpio 322 because this is actually a Narinco 322 with a different stock and barrel and that kind of thing. Uh, so I need some I need some uh, I need some mags if we have any listeners that uh, that have one that they would sell. They like they brought in a bunch of them. They brought in a bunch of these Scorpio 322s and 10 round mags that fit. And apparently those also work with this gun. So I want one if you've got one that you'll sell me. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna bulk order a bunch of ammo. Um, I still don't have a running uh, BCL 102. I'm waiting on True North Arms to get their AR10 shipment in, and then I'm gonna put some parts in that thing and get it running properly. Why? Our... What? But it's under warranty. Yeah, I'm still waiting on a, a bolt from them. How long does it take to send a bolt from Ontario? Mm, longer than it takes to get a bunch of CZ parts or any other parts that I've ordered. <sighs> crappy product followed up with crappy customer service. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think I know what the problem is, so I don't really care what their opinion is on it. I'm just going to wait for the parts to show up at true North arms. I'll order from them and I'll fix it myself and then sell it. I, I all my guns get sold. So that's, the, <laughs> that's Oop, yeah, no point. <laughs> but at least now uh, you could sell it with the clear contents. Yes. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sell it as is I'd have for to sale the, yeah. a functioning BCL 102. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the accuracy out of it's been good. So if I get it functioning, it's probably going to be fine. It's it's going to be fine as a, a semi-auto 308, right? Yep, that's the idea. Anyways, um, patches and stickers, they all shipped. So I've, uh, that order should be coming in, I don't know, a couple weeks. That kind Did of thing. you send some to your co-hosts? They're just, the whole batch is coming. So I will... <laughs> oh, I thought you meant you. you've been shipping out nope. to... My bad. Sorry. No, no, they are, they're coming from the patch place. I've got I've got some hunting gear guy ones. I got some Chaz ones. I got some slam fire ones. They're like a pile of stuff all coming up. Uh, 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 I've been continuing to add pat uh, not patches matches <laughs> to uh, three gun dot ca. Um, if you take a look and you're and and you take a look at just the the map view on it, you might be think that there are only matches in Alberta and BC uh, because for the for the early part of this year there are. And there are a ton of matches in Alberta and BC. Um, Mighty Peace is is uh, uh, going to be putting on like a ton of major matches this year, and Lakeland, and there's just a pile of three gun going on in Alberta and BC. And uh, just to stop my cat from like jumping all over the place, I I bought a cat bed. She's sleeping in it right now. Yeah. Did you notice in our interview uh, our guest cat crawling on the back of her chair? Yeah, and I I didn't want my cat like jumping all over the place here again on video. Anyways. Um, why don't we get on to upcoming events? Uh, the first one's from Ryan McLean. They're setting up a PRS club series in Ontario. Uh, this will be taking place at the Petawawa military base in conjunction with the Petawawa gun club matches will consist of eight to 10 stages shot on steel from 250 to 650 meters. 
expect your round count to be a hundred. Oh, that's a, that's a high round count. Holy a hundred rounds for a PRS match. Ooh. Uh, registration will open three months before each match because of base restrictions. These matches will be limited to two, two, three and three Oh eight. Please email Ryan at P E T P R S club match at gmail.com. If you have any questions and there will be red match registration links on practice score as well. Uh, if you have an event that you know of that uh, that we haven't talked about or that is coming up, please let us know. Uh, news. Let's see here. The first one, and this was almost two weeks ago to the day. Actually, tomorrow tomorrow's two weeks ago to the day is uh, Bill Blair's announcement that uh, he's going to be in two weeks. And given this is two weeks ago, he's going to be um, providing a report to the ministry to... Uh, on how to plug the leaks that put guns in the wrong hands. This ought to be good. Uh, so this is all like 100% speculation at this point because there is nothing out yet, but it should have come out by now or tomorrow. So we're waiting to see what's going to happen. But he said, saying that, uh, you know, there's the prime minister gave me a very clear mandate to look at every uh, measure up to and including banning handguns. Um, so you know, with a mandate of ban something. Uh, let's see what happens. Mm. Uh, the next p- uh, piece of news, this is kind of from my end of the country. Uh, Spruce Grove youth was charged after police seized 30 firearms and 2,000 rounds of ammo. And I believe this is, he not he knocked over a, a gun shop. He stole from a gun shop. Uh, around 3.30 a.m. Sunday, police responded to a call for a break-in, uh, break-in at a business near 115 Ave and 149th Street. Um, and this, the male suspect had entered a firearms business and was in the process of removing guns, ammunition, and military surplus items. I think this is SIBO, SIBO Arms. So we didn't go there yet, uh, but that's like a, a mil- military surplus place here in Edmonton. Um, anyways, they found him, and uh, he'll be charged with 20 offenses, including theft of motor vehicles and a whole bunch of other fun stuff that 17-year-olds shouldn't be up to. Yeah, exactly. When Especially I was on a school I night. Li- yeah, I was at the library on a school night when I was 17. I can't say I was, but uh, I wasn't I wasn't stealing from gun shops either. I couldn't spell library when I was 17. Mm. Probably still can't. Yeah, that's what your uh, autocorrect is for on your phone, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, have you seen the, the Brownells AR-180 upper that works on an AR-15 lower? Come again? No. What? Brownells has an AR-180 upper, so piston-driven AR upper that you can run a folding stock on and still run it because the springs are all in the upper. They're making a reproduction AR-180 upper. And it looks good. That's but it's an AR-180 upper that works with an AR-15 lower. So f- for us in Canada, this is like a non-starter already because yeah. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's going to be for a restricted firearms uh, uh, platform, right? But very interesting anyways. And they, they, they may get into doing a AR-180 upper that works on an AR-180 lower. So that would be interesting for us as well. Because again, we have a couple of manufacturers that are working on the 180 platform. And uh, it's kind of neat to have that uh, available here in Canada. Uh, last week, we talked about the Winchester Wildcat. And uh, and you were like, hey, are there any details? And I was like, no, <laughs> because it's brand new. And uh, we got some more details out the... the uh, the next day so um uh, basically the wildcat it's it's kind of interesting because there's a lot of modularity to it uh we mentioned the uh, uh it's got a machined in uh pick rail on, uh, on the top of the receiver it's also got uh, an iron sight uh, that's already on the back of the uh, receiver that's kind of like in line with the picatinny rail uh the lower receiver comes out with the push of a button you push this button at the back of the receiver and you just fold out the whole trigger group you know how like on a lot of uh, semi-auto 22s getting to the bolts to clean it is actually kind of a pain in the butt. It is like, or, or is like flat out, like a super pain in the butt, like on the seven ninety five, you have to like pull, yes, pull the trigger group out. And then the, it, the uh, bolt is on this single recoil spring. And if you do it wrong, you bend the recoil spring. And uh, the ten twenty two is you know, the ten twenty two. the five, nine, seven's got these guide rods. You need to like unscrew these little Winchester has a push button and it just comes out. <laughs> So uh, that that part's really interesting. Uh, let's see here. What else they got on this thing? They've got a, a ghost ring rear sight on it, uh, ramped front. But I think with a, 
uh, a Picatinny rail upper like receiver on this thing. You, it's it's really nice to just put a scope on this thing. And I'm loving that they're doing this instead of putting three eighths dovetail because I hate yes dovetail with all my heart. It's such a my, stupid pin. My CZ four fifty five is three Z do- is uh, three eighths dovetail. Well, I mean that rifle deserves a real scope, which deserves real rings. Oh wait, it's got the equivalent of a 22 or an air rifle rail. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. And some of them use three eighths and some of them use 11 millimeter, which is just a little bit different. And some rings will work and some of them won't. Oh, mm-hmm. oh. Give me, give me weaver bases. And I, uh, you're, you're seeing this. Some, some of the uh, rim fire manufacturers have been offering uh, weaver bases and to see some that now have a full pick rail on the top. Beautiful. Yeah. But I mean, this thing comes with a pick rail in, in integral it's it's yep. part of the upper yep. it is the upper yep it's like Which the, the last 1022 seen, receiver yeah i was gonna say like you you've you've seen that on some of the 1022s uh just machining it right in um oh one of the three one of the m14 manufacturers does that lrb lrb does that sound about right one of those mm-hmm. guys makes a makes a 308 receiver that has just the the uh scope mount right machined right in there it's a way to go interesting yeah, uh, the Wildcat also, you can release the bolt by uh, by ripping the charging handle, or there's a bolt release button, so you get both. Um, and they use a slightly different uh, striker design on the uh, uh, on the firing pin to, uh, to get shorter lock time. It's got a rotary magazine that doesn't look like a piece of crap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which I like I'm I'm saying that like Savage, I, I I'm not a fan of Shat Savage's new uh, rotary mags. I've got one in my B mag and I oh. just hate it so much. It's it's so cheap and chintzy. I, I think yeah, even the uh, just don't like how it locks in. Yeah. That folding piece of plastic clip. Ugh. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, but the the here's the interesting thing. The Wildcat comes with a rotary mag, it accepts ten twenty two mags. Isn't that interesting? Really? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Exactly. That's a wise move. That's like a guy building a PCC rifle and making it take a Glock mag. That's how smart <laughs> that was. Yeah. 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 That one seems obvious now, but I guess it wasn't obvious a ways back. And some people thought they would make their own mags. Yeah. Dumb. I'm glad. I'm glad that some platform or some accessories are now like the accessories that you have to support for a platform because uh, there's too much proprietary uh, parts in, in, in firearms. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's very cool. They've got a bunch of other pick rail parts and that kind of thing on that Wildcat. But I think the most interesting part is, A, just how easy it is to uh, uh, to clean it and to take it down. And uh, uh, B, that, uh, that pic- Picatinny rail on the top is very interesting as well. Uh, let's see here. If you're in the market for a super cheap 50 BMG wand stalls. I do want a BMG. Yeah, uh, Gallum was here and he was talking about his BM, his 50 BMG, and I'm like, I didn't know he had a 50 BMG. So he bought one of those uppers supposed to go in an air lower. Yeah, the but Canada Alberta Apple ones. Yeah, but Alberta Tactical made modifications to one of their lowers or yep. or introduced a non restricted lower to go specifically with that upper. Correct. And of course, those uppers are chinesium and need a little bit of work, or you blow your arm all the... Sh- not like the guy from X-Metal did when he had that uh, yep. auto battery. Um, they fix all that so that they don't blow you up, and they made it go on a non-restricted lower. I had no idea. Yep. And that was that was one of the cheaper ways of doing a, a 50 BMG. Yeah. This is cheaper. How much cheaper? So, oof, it's well, not cheaper it, than that. can't be cheaper than that. Absolutely, it's cheaper than that. Uh, the RN50, it kind of looks like a, the back of it looks like a pipe bomb. Like you screw in this thing, <laughs> it's got a hammer on it. Uh, they're, I think they're 1500 bucks. Just one second. You're right. That's cheaper. They are 1859 if you want to get it with the buttstock and the bipod or 1499 without. Yeah, but I don't think a 50 BMG is something you should be skimping on. Uh, well, what's skimping? Okay, like it's a pain in the, it's, it's, uh, uh, inconvenient uh, to use by screwing it in, but the other one's a single shot as well. Yes, and the other one's blowing up on people, and this one hasn't because it's basically like a, a muzzle, a modern muzzle loader. How they have the the screw in cap on the back, right? Yeah, more like, yeah, it's a breech loading muzzle loader. <laughs> Fifty BMG. 
breech loading. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyways, they're putting an order in. So if you're, uh, I, and I've been looking, I've been looking at these, um, a little bit because I think it would be funny to, uh, to go deer hunting with one of those. But, uh, did you see that video of the guy who tried to shoot a doe with one and he was going for a headshot and he actually missed, but the concussion of the bullet passing by the deer's, did you see that video? I think that guy is uh, a moron. And yeah. I think that uh, that bullet did hit that deer and that he just couldn't find it because you cannot tell me that the concussion of a bullet passing by killed that deer. I well, don't, I don't it, believe it for a second. I think this guy's uh, just made everyone dumber by saying it. It would be safe to say if this was true, that you could blow up water bottles simply by shooting near them. And you can't. It, right. A miss is a miss. Yeah. yeah, but I did see it, and I'm like, yeah, I think with a 50 cal. Yep. Uh, There's one at the shop, an RN 50 or no, no, a real, a real legit 50. I don't remember the the brand name right now, but it's it's an actual gun. It's not a pipe on a airsoft lower. Like it's it's got it's mag fed. It's got a break. It's got a um, uh, an amazing bipod. It's probably not fifteen hundred dollars. Like, no, it's like five grand. Yeah, it's see fifteen hundred. I could fly. I could fly that. I could. I could do. I could do fifteen hundred. Screw around with it a little bit and be like, actually, I don't like this, and then sell it. But like five grand, oof. <laughs> <laughs> I would do that for like a daily driver. If I was gonna like, you know what, Shadow Glock. Why am I messing around with this stuff? I'm gonna sell all of them. I'm gonna get a, a twenty eleven. And I'm going to put five grand into it. It's going to be my daily driver. I will need no other pistols. I get it. A 50 is like not a serious like competition gun or anything that you get. It's like a daily driver. No, like if I spend $5,000 and I only have access to 600 yards on the range and I'm spending like $84 for some ammo, I need to have my head examined. Like I need, I need to be hospitalized. I'm not, I've gone cuckoo for cocoa puffs. Yeah. I'd, I would have to be incredibly wealthy to just go, what do I care? Yeah. Like spending five yeah. grand on a gun you can't afford to shoot is, and and when you can afford to shoot it, you, your range is a maximum of 600 yards. I would want a 50 grand. Uh, let's face it. I want a 50 cal. So when my buddies come into my gun room, I go, oh yeah, and there's my 50. How's yeah. it shoot? Don't know. Can't afford to shoot it. But there's my 50. <laughs> Looks great. <laughs> yeah. Where's your 50? You know, it's like, yeah. shut up. Yeah. No, I would buy it to to uh, to shoot stupid stuff. Oh yeah, I would. Oh, well, that's all I would ever yeah. do. I wouldn't. I'd sight it in on paper, and then after that, everything else I shot would be like have to explode. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Moving on from fifties. Oh, the other side of the of the uh, coin. Uh, Hatsan has a twenty two LR uh, bolt action rifle. This is a CZ four fifty two knockoff for three fifty. MSRP. No, you don't so say. I don't know what it's going to actually sell for, but it runs CZ452. I think the mags are compatible. I'm not quite sure. It does not look like a CZ452. It's got like a synthetic stock. It's got the magazine. Oh, you that lost me at Hats and Escort. Well, I started with Hats and Escort. Yeah, I wasn't listening. Mm, but it's 350 MSRP. Don't care. I wonder what actual retail would be on these things. And if they pull the accuracy of the CZ. Cause that would be interesting. Probably won't. Oh, I don't know. Like... Anyways, those are out. Uh oh yeah. Did you know that Norinko makes uh a 12.7 millimeter rifle? No. Yeah, apparently they do. What I don't the... know I don't know why we don't have these in Canada. They should bring these 12. in. 12.7 by 108 millimeters. Yeah. Semi auto wouldn't, wouldn't that be fun to have out here? I don't want a 50 anymore. I want this. I mean, it seems My like goodness. the uh, it seems like the right kind of thing to bring in, right? Twelve point seven by one hundred eight is a is a big boy cartridge. Can I shoot into space? Uh, well, you can do pretty much anything that you can with a fifty. Perfect. Let's do that then. Yeah, we're just gonna import them. Being that they're they're Norinco, they should be like what, like a thousand bucks. Hey, it's a five run capacity, so we're already there. Yeah, we're already good on the. We don't even need to put a pin in it. No, it's semi auto. It's very reasonably set up for the Canadian market already. It's got yeah. a muzzle brake from a tank. You would need one, yeah. Yeah, I'm in. Yeah. And then I'll go to the Madre range down the road that's completely in clo- closed in and is only 100 meters and shoot it there. 
mag dump it there. <laughs> yeah. Wait yeah. until wait until someone's like there and like just teaching like their kids or something and go over there and just mag dump. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> be, it, that, be I, that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Or or wait till somebody takes their ears off because you're not supposed to when you're in that building and let it rip. <laughs> and when he starts crying, uh, say, hey, dude, it's a hot firing line. What do you want from me? Yeah, I wasn't done. You I know what it looked like I was. So I was yeah. drinking on my coffee, but actually I was shooting. That's right. It was a bait. You took it. <laughs> you want to talk? Call Oprah. This is a gun range. Uh, all right. Why don't we get on to our main topic? Okay. <laughs> all right. We're having a laughing uh, startup then. Welcome back to the show. Tracy Wilson from the CCFR. Tracy, there's been a whole bunch of... Uh, of uh, uh gun stuff in the news one of the ones i think i saw uh on the uh, firearms rights website uh, ccfr's website was this one about the cbc pulling uh, a couple of articles why don't you tell us about uh kind of what went on there yeah thanks adriel so actually the in, in these articles that they had originally done for us which was um it was two parts of a four-part series uh written by mark montgomery who's uh, been kind of friendly to our cause. He's seen a lot of the narrative going on and a lot of the false information and corrections. So he wanted to do a, a, a short series that's basically just facts, right? Just, you know, data only, um, very technical. So he went to the experts and he's a, he actually accomplished something that nobody else has accomplished. And that's actually getting the organizations to work together. So uh, there was a bunch of us who had worked together on this, the uh, Tony from the CSSA, Blair from the NFA, uh, Dr. Gary Mauser, Dennis Young, Nick from the Gun Blog. We were all on this email chain and we would be answering these questions. And that's what he used for the content for the first two parts of the series. So the first one was the gun debate in Canada, Where Lies Truth? because that was right after the whole 50% domestically sourced fiasco. And then the second part was the gun debate in Canada, assault weapons, which is, you know, a, we all know exactly how that goes. So, yeah, he had started this series. And um, instead of doing an emotion-based, you know, radical anti-gun piece, which is typical out of the CBC with pictures of women holding up scary firearms and, um, stuff like that, he decided he would do just a, a nice technical piece, you know, okay, so what is the truth? And then the second part was, what are assault weapons? And do we have them? So we all worked together on this, even OFA joined in on the second part, um, which is the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. So this was a, like an all of community uh, project. So it was pretty groundbreaking as far as I'm concerned. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, it's been out for a little while. The, the second one drew some attention by the anti-gun lobby and they decided it was uh, too, too fact-based. We needed some emotion and some rhetoric in there. So they complained and um, of course it was taken down. So um, yeah, both go, were taken down. Yeah, both, both parts were taken down. Now the CBC has come back because of course I launched an all out war on, on, um, on them for doing this. But they have come back and said that they are going to be reproducing these with a more balanced look. And, you know, my response to that is when you're talking about truth, you know, we can write opinion pieces every day, right? Uh, you know, Heidi's got her opinion. I've got mine. We can go through this all day. And that's exactly what we've gotten out of CBC for years on this topic. This was not meant to be an opinion piece. This was meant to be technical, factual, and data oriented, right? So... I, you know, there, w there isn't two sides to the truth. The truth is the truth. So it'll be interesting to see if they do put it back out. I know they are getting completely hammered by everybody um, who have, who has answered my call to action to complain about the other pieces. Uh, Rod actually spent a couple hours going through CBC and RCI, which is Radio Canada International, a subsidiary of CBC, and going through their websites and finding all this completely biased pieces, right? Because they're saying, well, everything should have a balance. Well, all right, if we're going to have a balance, then let's go back through all these articles and let's get them fair and balanced. So they're getting completely hammered right now. And oh, be careful what you wish for. Yeah. If they want, if they're going to, pull that line and say everything should be balanced oh okay well no one got your uh, anti-gun articles pulled because they weren't balanced 
hypocrite much. Right. So, yeah. And, and my response to them is, you know, when the things that we are discussing in the article are technical and factual in nature, they're not emotion based. There is no other side. Fact, there are no alternative facts. There's only right. truth. <clears throat> so, We're not talking about an opinion piece. We're talking about uh, a report on facts. It's right. Like and an the, information piece, not a narrative. I mean, even that correction, there, there was a correction article on the uh, on why those stats were wrong. The uh, Toronto police uh, and uh, 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 crime guns uh, statistics, that correction that went out was an opinion piece. So these two pieces being not opinion, it, like does mean something right. There's it, it, it's it has to hold up to a higher level of scrutiny and a higher level of uh, fact based reporting rather than just opinions. Absolutely. And and this is why um, Mr. Montgomery took the opportunity to consult, you know, actual experts in the field and, you know, get our answers. Some there were some things I know um, that he wanted just a kind of a definitive definition of uh, what an assault weapon was. This was for the second part. And uh, Tony happened to answer that question quicker than anybody else. So we just backed up his answer because it was it was correct, the, right? The answer. <laughs> it was the answer. And uh, I had a couple of people ask me, well, why didn't you respond? You know, it just says CSSA response. And I said, because I totally support his response. I, what do you want me to say? Ditto what Tony said. Yep. So I concur. Yeah. You should have concurred, really. Yeah. Though. That's the move. Concur. Probably, yeah. You yeah. Just, yeah. Look and say, I concur. It's funny too, because just yesterday morning, there was a uh, Heidi Ratchin was on a, a show out of Quebec. It's called seven jours sur terre. And she, she made a statement that the Ruger mini 14 bullets explode on impact. So, and of course that's in the article, Canadians who would not have other, you know, otherwise not have that knowledge are thinking, wow, this is crazy. These bullets explode on impact. It just sounds so crazy, right? But this is what happens when you have people who watch Hollywood movies and who are completely emotionally involved in this debate are put when, out there as some sort of authority on the subject. And when the guest is spewing rhetoric that um, supports your narrative, you don't correct her. You don't call her on it. No. The reporter could very well know that we don't have exploding ammunition in Canada, regardless of the firearm you shoot it out of. But or just ask for clarification. Oh, exploding! Yeah. Hey, how does it yeah. explode? Does it have yeah. a charge set in it? Is it? No. Uh, yeah. Would never do that. Spring loaded or something? Well, this is the problem: is they're not they are not firearms experts, so for them to make any statements is ridiculous. But the problem is. What they do have is a continuous prevalent platform on mainstream media, right? You know, let's hold up these victims. It's really good virtue signaling. Let's hold up these victims. And they can say and do whatever they want. And, you know, if you question them or you try and correct them, then you're racist. attacking them. Uh, oh, you wouldn't believe the stuff Pauli Souvier um, says about me, right? That I'm attacking oh, yeah. a victim of a shooting. Well, yeah. hey, man, you're responsible for what you say and what you do. You, you know? got it. Yep. It's yeah. not about it's not about victims. It's about you getting corrected when you're wrong. And it's just science and it's just the facts and it's nothing personal about it. You said something that's absolutely not true and we're gonna call you on it. That's not attacking. Not but at you know all. what? See, they've got that that constant access to a platform, right? Yeah. Um, because they're the squeaky wheel. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Mothers against everything gets <laughs> they get all kinds of traction. They're a squeaky wheel, squeaky wheel, social justice warriors. They like, it's like, oh God, if we don't give them a voice, we're never going to hear the end of it. Well, we need to be the squeaky wheel. We need to just completely hammer the CBC for what they did. And we need to hammer those people with the facts when they make those false statements in the media and not attack them, but be a squeaky wheel. Say you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And this is what it actually is. To the point where it's like, oh, God, do we want to run this story? You know, if we do, the CCFR is going to be breathing down our necks again. Well, I mean, that's, that's where that's, we're at. Yeah, that's, that's, um, yeah, we can, we can apply pressure. If, if you look at, uh, the editor that, that, uh, you were responding to there, Tracy, go look through his Twitter. Um, he's never going to support uh, a pro gun article. Never. It, for, no. for him to pull a pro gun article, makes a lot of sense because it, it like for for that for a person that that believes in the the kinds of things he does it would be wrong it would be an, a factually incorrect 
does not match my worldview article. It's interesting, too, because um, one of our members, he's a field officer. Of course, I've got everybody hammering the heck out of the CBC. So in in one of the responses that's been forwarded to me, it says here, he's talking about, um, you know, trying to embrace a bit of a nuance when you're trying to create a balanced, um, you know, story. And he says here, when addressing the fact that we had provided links to 20 stories, that were completely one-sided and unopposed. You know, the anti-gun lobby was given free reign to say whatever they want. He says, and I'll quote him, that is all the more so true when it comes to assessing balance over time. Each story has its own context, which may or may not call for the inclusion of a particular voice. So the excuse for having a completely unopposed anti-gun bias story is because there just wasn't a call for the inclusion of our voice. However, on a piece where we are literally providing factual technical data, now there is a call for the inclusion of an opinionated voice, right? Or, so. a, or a, a call for the exclusion of your of our voice. Correct. It's yeah. If if they just wanted to add in the anti like I, I was waiting for the other shoe to drop on these two articles. I saw them I saw the first one come down. It's like, oh man, this is a serious K. The next one is gonna be all anti-gun. They're gonna interview a bunch of people who are anti-gunners, and it's gonna be a uh, wackadoodle art complete wackadoodle art article, and, and that'll be the next one that comes out. And then the other one came out. I'm like, oh, oh, oh wait a minute. What's up with all these facts? This isn't what I'm really right? used to. <laughs> I know CBC article this is weird. Um, so for it to be like pulled afterwards is is uh, deplatforming, right? It's uh, it's, yeah. it's something that the um, I don't consider myself left or right. I consider myself like supremely libertarian. Uh, but the left has been deplatforming uh, right and centrist uh, viewpoints. Pro gun would be one of the one of the areas they're trying to deplatform. Well, and I'm really interested to see if they do somehow. I don't even know how they're going to reproduce this and include the other voice when these are are meant to be data driven pieces so i'm not really sure how they're going to do that so it'll be interesting to see if they reproduce it but for those who who didn't get an opportunity to read them uh, we have the historical archived links in my story on the ccfr website so you can still read them and i i would recommend reading them and share them yeah i mean the or original ones were good they were like you said, fast bit fact based. Uh, there was there was like references for everything, <laughs> everything, everything. Well, all the little to, points right? were like boom and reference and boom and ref and boom and here's the link to this thing. It wasn't uh, uh, you know I feel this way or here's a here's some sort of percent statistic that's uh, that's not an absolute number, so it's hard to uh, hard to take into account. No, it was uh, yeah. It's I think it's uh, uh, a sign of our times and a sign of uh, of what the CBC is right now. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a post on the CCFR group. And it's also on my personal wall, which is completely public to everybody. And uh, I've got the information there if you want to help out and take part in contacting the ombudsman and make a complaint. You know, this is what we have to do. There are is strength in numbers and we have to hammer them every time you see a story. And if you do see a story and it is one sided, post it out there or send it to me or send it to somebody get it out there and let's get everybody dogpiling on it we have no choice this is just how we have to how we have to play this game yeah at the end of the year when they do that re report uh the ombudsman does a, does a report on like what the people have been complaining about and they've been complaining about this huge part piece of the pie chart is that uh, <laughs> is uh, we're we have an anti-gun slant uh, at the cbc and then that's something that people are complaining about then hopefully that uh, that forces some changes Absolutely, considering it's our taxpayer dollars funding them, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. That's Stick it. That like in. a lot of public service servants and crown corporations need to be reminded who they work for. Now, I'm not that guy that says to a cop, "I pay your salary," even though I do. Um, it's a good way to get tased. It's a great way to get tased, and that's why I would never say. Have it. you Plus, ever I been have... tased? No, I asked Officer Frank to do it, but he's like, if you die, I've got to do paperwork, and I don't like paperwork, and it's like, fine, right. whatever, you know. Okay, maybe we can so, make one or something. Yeah. Fundraiser for Gallon will taste his sack next time. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> we saw the, how else are we going to up the pepper spray? Right? right? I know, that was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that was but, crazy. Shenanigans. Uh, shenanigans, yeah. yeah. Cool. That was Mr. Elliot's idea, more or less. I've got more good news if you want some. Yeah, some good fire news. away. What else yeah, is going news. on? Okay, so I've been hitting the road a lot lately on my little Tracy tour. And uh, 
there's been a little bit of a war brewing on Twitter between what we previously kind of considered anti-gun people and what these were, were um, like these communities against gun violence groups and victims groups. They are traditionally anti-gun. Yeah, Twitter is where it's at, to be honest, for political battling. Yeah. But I, we started to, they started to notice in a lot of my tweets and, you know, just the language and the, the type of messaging put out by gun owners that, well, wait, wait a minute, they also want less crime, right? So it's taken a very long time, but I, I went to Toronto last weekend. I'm going to give a shout out to Evelyn Fox from Communities Against Gun Violence, and that's a group that's... Um, primarily made up of moms who have lost their kids to gun violence, right? Um, not all of it gang violence, but either way, it's uh, murders, right? So uh, she was there. She actually hosted the meeting. Uh, the Zero Gun Violence Movement was there. That's Louis March. He's been all over social media. Uh, there was another group there called One by One, and they called themselves Formers. So these are, this group is comprised of former gang leaders and um, former like white supremacists and stuff like that. They've sort of been converted, and now they're working with at-risk youth in their communities to try and, and keep people out. And then um, on the other side of, of the boardroom table, we had... Uh, I had invited Alison DeGroote from the CSAAA, which is the gun shop lobby, not to be confused with the CSSA, and Emily Brown, who is, uh, she's a professor, she's really well spoken, but she's also a representative from the Ontario, and I believe the National Trap Shooting Association in Canada. So basically, we had three, three girls on the pro-gun side. And we sat down. This was a very historic meeting. It was super emotional. Allison Lyons was there. She um, she testified uh, during uh, deliberations on C-71 in front of the Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security, which Rod and I did too. Um, and she, her daughter was killed by a licensed gun owner, her ex. Um, so she's really emotionally invested in this and it her and I have, have not been friends so we've gone at each other but I I really think this meeting um it was a preliminary start off it was three hours to be honest we needed 10 it's um it's going to continue but this was completely groundbreaking because I feel like there's been an intentional divide created by government at all levels to keep us apart and keep us divided and fighting. You know, your kids were killed by guns. You should hate guns. Uh, you people love guns. You know, you all have to hate each other. And at the end of the day, they do respect sports shooters and hunters and legitimate lawful gun owners. Um, so we're going to continue working with them. I, I never want anything like that just to be a photo op and be dropped. You know me. I'm going to be back in there working with these people, uh, they're also pissed at government at all levels because you've got, um, you know, funding dollars being allocated to fight guns and gangs, 96% of it going to law enforcement, which, yeah, law enforcement needs some help too, but that leaves 4% for community groups. And we all know if you want to stop violence, the cops help after the violence is committed, solving yeah. the crimes. They're reactive, not proactive. I right. mean, and the they're they do have like the community officer for my school, never seen them. Right. Like it's good to say we have community officers for the schools, but if they can't free these people up to do that role, mm. then let somebody else do it. Like other community groups, other outreach centers, drop-in centers, places for people to go rather than just hang out and get in trouble. 4% right. is and not going to do it. 4% is not going to do it. It's not going to do anything. And then that 4%, what they, what the city of Toronto did was they just, um, they just kind of refunded the, whatever groups they already had in place. So there was no measurement of success, you know, like, Hey, let's look back over the last two years and see if this group was able to turn any kids around or do anything. So, that's, you know, these, that's horrible. Like, I don't horrible. Know if, you know, if you've looked at uh, at some of the historical success of some of these, but some of them, Dare is the Dare program is actually one of them that's that's come up. Kids who went through the Dare program were more likely to do drugs than kids who didn't. So it's not it's not even that it it was ineffective. It had the opposite effect that we wanted. So like these programs all need to be like carefully measured to to understand which which of them succeed and which of them. Uh, are ineffective or uh, 
the wrong effect. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So detrimental, I think, very dualist. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Teach. <laughs> wrong effect. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so we're going to we're going to continue to work with them because, you know, traditionally the, you know, pro-gun lobby or whatever in Canada has always just, you know, had one one mandate, look after the interests of gun owners. I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think there's room in this to have it twofold where we can look after the interests of gun owners while at the same time holding government to account to work, you know, do credible work on crime. So um, I think it's probably the government's worst nightmare is to have people like us sitting with people like them and saying, hey, none of us are happy. So, yeah, it'll yeah. be a really great alliance. Yeah, I think uh, uh, division politics is is very strong in the in, in the U.S. and starting to bleed over here in Canada. And I'm, I'm glad to see you guys bridging the gap. I said to them, I opened up and I said, you know. Uh, I'm Tracy. I'm the Canada's only in-house registered gun lobbyist, but I'm a mom and I'm a grandma and I want to save for Canada too. So that's got to be the message, right? And and it's true. That's exactly the truth. So um, anyway, so that that's going to be great. There'll be more to come on that. That literally was just a preliminary meeting to kind of outline, um, you know, that, that we're on the same path. Look for some really fun stuff, like maybe parliamentary press conference. We're going to do some stuff together and shake this government up. And, you know, if we got to, if we got to drag them unwillingly down the road of working on crime, I'm prepared to do that. Pause, pause, not claws, no dragging people. <laughs> I, I can like literally see you with somebody by. I can see you with somebody by the ear, <laughs> Na Nana Tracy pulling them by the ear into. No, you can't. That's happened before. I but know. We'll save, we'll save it for another show. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Well, speaking speaking of getting out there and getting active, last night I went to a couple different events. So I crossed over to the dark side and joined my brothers in Quebec as they opposed their long gun registry. Uh, uh, can I rant on this for one second before go, you go on? All right, go. look, Montreal is the is the uh, mecca for gun control in Canada. There's not a more pro gun or pro uh, gun control place than Montreal. Montreal, the same town that said, "No way will an Alberta pipeline that will benefit the rest of Canada cross through our town." Right? So, no, no pipeline. Yes, registry, and Alberta is going to pay for it. Right. Alberta is paying for Quebec's registry. My head wants to explode. Go. Okay. Okay. That is noted. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, TCRQ uh, and Guy Moray, all those guys, they were out there. And I, you know what's really funny? I was looking at um, Le Devoir did a piece on it, and they said a couple dozen gun owners, uh, uh, chasseurs, a couple dozen hunters were out there protesting. Dude, there was over 300 people there, you know, and it, like we're in a polar vortex. I'm wearing a toque in the house here. Like it's <laughs> minus 32 degrees out and there's hundreds of people and everybody in their orange vests um, out there. It was great. I got an opportunity thanks to Guy Moray to kind of address the audience, which I was the only English content. You know, it's a, it's a French Quebec protest. I get it. I don't speak French. So I, I was really well received and I just kind of wanted to let them know that, um, you know, Canada stands with them. And uh, yeah, anyways, it was it was pretty cool. So uh, for all those listening, do not listen to the mainstream Quebec media. There was not a couple dozen gun owners. There was hundreds of people. And the lineup of cars going uh, past the casino were honking in support. And, you know, they, they do not have the support for this registry that they're pretending they do. Uh, the... Counts of people going to these protests is interesting because I've seen that uh, that kind of manip media manipulation as well, where they'll take pictures that look like there's just a couple dozen people when there's a few hundred, or they'll take a picture that looks like it's very crowded, but it's actually from the back. There's heads and shoulders, and you can't see that. Uh, there's eight people at this thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, RCI, funny enough, was there, and you know, um, I was polite, but uh, they were. Guy was talking and, you know, they were filming and it was in French. I don't know what was going on, but I noticed, you know, there's this big crowd of 300 people kind of milling about and they had Guy at the edge of it. So you, on this side of the camera screen, you could see people. And on this side, it was like parking lot. Right. So it makes it look not. But the, if you pan over, there's hundreds of people there. It was a sea of orange vests and it was deep. I know I got up on the bank and 
uh, the snowbank and, and spoke into the megaphone. And I couldn't believe how far back the people were. Like it, it was, it was a huge turnout. And, um, you know, it's interesting to see all the municipalities joining in. They're passing motions at city council meetings to object to this provincial registry. So be interesting to see what Legault does with this. But yeah, what a mess. Yeah, awesome. Uh, any Anything else you want to tell us about? Um, Did some A-tips yesterday. I've got one on Gerald Butts. There was a, an interesting little tidbit of information that came on an order paper in the House of Commons. It is was it on true? An, is it true his real name is actually Seymour? Yes. No, oh, that's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> so there, were, I, I got a little glimpse of a of an order paper on there. Did you get a little glimpse of Mr. Butts? Oh, God. <laughs> you, All did right, you did that. I did that. Uh, yeah. I ruined everything. I'm a ruiner. Yeah. So anyways, he had requested a uh, some data from StatsCan. So the chief statistician of Canada had sent him a letter. Now, this was back in September of 2018. And of course, we've never heard anything about this letter. And I am wondering why. Is it because the information in that letter doesn't necessarily support the liberal mandate of being anti-gun? Does it challenge their stats that they've been putting out? Well, inquiring minds want to know. So I have A-tipped StatsCan, and just for good measure, I also A-tipped the Privy Council office to make sure that I get a timely copy of the letter to Mr. Butts. So Now, what are the chances that you'll receive that redacted? Is that a thing? Well, um, how do they decide it's very difficult. You know? Yeah. Well, if it's redacted, yeah, I'm going to challenge it because, you know, technically the only things that should be redacted is personal information. This was uh, literally a, um, a request for information uh, on st uh, stats for gun crimes. So if it's redacted, then I guess I won't be going to CBC because we know they won't run it. But trust me, I'll be shouting this from the uh, the steps of Parliament Hill to every media that'll that'll listen. So yeah, the we'll truth know is that, out there. Yeah, we'll know that your tinfoil hat wasn't on too tight if it comes in redacted. Mm -hmm. Do you have, Do you have any pictures of the crowd? Like I'm looking at a CBC article right now, and it says this 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 was the one at uh, Manawaki, Manawaki, close enough. That was a couple of years ago. We last night oh, we were in Gatineau one. at the casino. Gatineau. Yeah. If you if you go on my my personal profile on Facebook, there's a video that I posted there, and I'm speaking, but you can fast forward through it. And Colin's actually videotaping me speaking, and then he turns around and he literally does a, a 360 pivot, and you can see the sea of vests, like tons of people. Or go on um, the TCRQ uh, Facebook page or Guy Mores, and there's tons and tons of pictures there and like you can very easily see that it was a huge crowd and considering the temperatures here in the nation's capital it's pretty impressive i mean i know i i shook for three hours afterwards but yeah crazy hmm. but i did leave there one more last quick thing i left there and i went to um a little political event pierre paul Huss was there he is our shadow minister for public safety and it was a um I guess, a, a support event for Justina McCaffrey. So she is the conservative candidate in Kanata Carlton, which is not my home writing, but I, I am uh, working really hard to make sure she's successful because who she's running against in the next federal election is um, Karen McCrimmon, who is Ralph Goodale's parliamentary secretary. So yeah, that's that. So I was just politicking all over the place last night. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, well, uh, yeah, uh, thanks again for coming on and uh, giving us the update and telling us definitely about those CBC stories because that was something I was wondering about uh, how how those even got made and it looks like uh, looks like now we know and and uh, and well, knowing is half the battle. Knowing is half the battle. Yeah. Yeah. Sh shame on them for shame on that reporter for trying to put something factual out. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Truth be damned. Uh, but the moral of what has happened is get after the ombudsman. Uh, and and hold them accountable uh don't be hypocritical what's good for the goose is good for the gander and other uh cliches that suit my purpose right now absolutely yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we should be able to refer to to them saying that no we need to put out only unbiased stuff and we should call out every single article that's got that bias on it yep absolutely yeah we're gonna keep doing that awesome thanks for coming on again tracy okay thanks for having me guys
Thanks, Trace. I love your shirt, by the way. Thanks. We're <laughs> brother and sister. I should have put my toque on. Yeah. <laughs> I actually just have it on because I have bad hair, but I was like, well, I'm in a polar vortex, so it's fine. I put yeah. it on because I have no hair. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a great night. Thank you so much for coming on short notice. It was awesome. As always, you're an awesome friend of the show and uh, an amazing friend to all gunnies across Canada. Yay. All yeah. right, guys. All right. Have a good show. Talk to Thanks. you later. Thanks. Night. Night. Man, I wanted to thank Tracy again for coming on the show and letting us all know about what's going on with the CBC and CCFR and Quebec and all that good stuff. Uh, yes, listener indeed. feedback. Uh, do you have you I'm been looking, on our yep. YouTube? Oh, yes. Um, no real questions, just um, some cheap shots at me as per the usual. Um, Richard saying hello, talking about getting touched by a police officer in grade seven. Um, what else? I mean, if it's not the police officer, it's usually the priests. Yeah. Yeah. Or the priest and the police officer. Yep. That's it. There's no real questions. Just some, Hey guys and stuff. And Mark Hookham showed up late, but that's not his fault. I'm sure. Cool. So regular feedback. Yeah, uh, our regular feedback is sponsored by Armory DC Gunsmith. Armory DC Gunsmith is a full-service gunsmith who specializes in firearms refinishing. They offer hot bluing, parkerizing, and Cerakote finishes, as well as wood refinishing. Check out their online inventory of new and used guns, firearms, accessories, optics, and more at dcgunsmith.ca. That's eight accessories with an axe, not ass accessories. That's right. Yeah, those are like seats and, and that kind of thing. and. Patches. He he just did a hunting bolt action rifle in cryptic camo. Check it out. I think he's posted the pictures to the social media. If not, um, he sent them to me. I'll get them posted. Wow, is all I gotta say. Cryptic Cerakote camo is really nice on a gun. It really is. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That does sound really cool. Is it uh, here? I think I found it. Um, was it uh, was it this hunting firearm right here? Stand by. I'm just sh sharing it with the, <laughs> on my screen right here. Is it this one? <laughs> no, it wasn't that one. That that's no? a oh sorry, uh, white and red DP12. Yeah, I very easily could get confused with the uh, hunting. Absolutely, yeah. and and one of the one of the simpler firearms to disassemble and reassemble. I might add. Really? I if he had given that to me, I'd, guessed. No, no. If he had given it to me, I'd quit. I'd be like, please give me a challenge. I ain't working here no more. Awful. It's basically a Keltec. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, listener feedback. We've got the first one here from Kyle. Uh, hey guys, I just wanted to share my thoughts on the double alpha PDR pro two. I bought one for my grand power X caliber for Ipsic last year. Uh, it didn't fit, fit the gun very well out of the box, even though it was designed for it. So I had to remove the bottom retention screw and rubber spacer at the bottom completely. It's a single layer of Kydex. So it's very thin and flimsy. Unless you're a large person around the middle, there's a good chance it's not even IPSC legal for you because it puts the gun a lot more than 50 millimeters away from your body. To get the gun almost exactly at 50 millimeter, I had to adjust the angle on it uh, as far as it would go so that the muzzle was pointing to the right away from me. <clears throat> you can't adjust it closer or further from your body like Double Alpha's race holsters. It needs three different Allen keys to adjust. Uh, the ball joint is a nice novelty, but not worth the price for the amount you'll actually adjust it. One star would not recommend. Next year, I'll be using a Shadow Mate with either a Blade Tech or a Red Hill Tactical on a Ben Stover Boss Hammer uh, Boss Hanger. Cheers from Kyle. So, hmm. sounds blowing. like a grand power problem to me. Uh, no, it sounds like he, <laughs> any any opportunity. <laughs> any uh, opportunity. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like. Uh, uh, yeah, sounds like he yeah. uh, didn't like it. Remember, <laughs> and I'm not talking to just Kyle here. Kyle knows Kyle has been in the game long enough. He knows this, but remember, not every holster is an Ipsic holster. We had to deal with a big controversy a couple of years ago about the Blade Tech um, Kydex holsters that came with the dropped and offset holster or hanger. Mm -hmm. And those dropped and offset uh, hangers made them uh, illegal on almost everyone who wore them. And uh, people, there was like backlash. Why would Blade Tech sell a holster? It's not Ipsic legal. They sell holsters, not 
Ipsic holsters. You're no, talking about their pro holster. Yeah, they're pro that has that open top and then the drop and offset on it. It probably puts yep. the butt of the gun too far away from the uh, body, right? It's it's not. Yes, it does. But it's not the butt we measure from. We measure from the inside center line of the grip. So not the center line going down the middle of the grip, the side of the grip, the grip panel closest to your body, mm -hmm. the center of that so that you don't twist the butt in or out too much in any one direction. It's got to be the center there. So like there on the gun. Let me see. Hold on. I don't have you on the correct. That's, Adriel. That's yeah. correct. That's where we measure it from. Okay. All right. Um, you want to take the next one from Mark? Sure. Uh, one, but for, for Kyle, Kyle, before you go with the Ben stagger boss hanger, check out the CR speed Seabax hanger. I am a huge fan of it's kind of the same idea, but more adjustable. Um, and, but it, you, you hook a holster to it the same way you do the boss hanger, but, um, more adjustability. All right. From Mark too far down. Hold on. Hi guys. And girl, girl's not here. Just guys. I was wondering if I can file the slide catch on my shadow two to make the slide stop the slide drop. When I insert a mag, is this modification allowed in production or will this throw me into open? I'd also like to mention that you guys are awesome. I really look forward to your show every week. Much love, Mark. Mark, you may not find we're awesome after we answer your question. You cannot do any gunsmithing to your gun other than light polishing. Uh, no, you can. You can replace all kinds of trigger mechanisms now, can't That's you? That's not gunsmithing. Gunsmithing mm. involves files and tools. Replacing trigger mechanisms is just, those are just drop in parts. You were not supposed to have to modify your gun to accept those. That is the distinguishing thing there. That makes sense? Not supposed to have to. Right. Um, Difficult so to tell if I did or not. If you have to, if you have to fit some of those trigger parts within reason, yes. But modifying a factory part to gain an advantage, like as soon as I put the mag in, the slide goes forward. Uh, that's a nay nay in production. You're not supposed to file on that part. Um, oh, you're going to be able to tell too, because it's like even with some wear on it, it's uh, it wouldn't have a lot on the on the part that you'd need to nail. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's a nay nay mark. Um, the uh, solution to this mark is never let your uh, gun go dry. Don't shoot the slide lock. Remember to reload on the move. Yep. That's uh, always a good option. I mean, like a lot of a lot of the way that they set up Ipsic stages are such that there's there's never more than ten rounds from a spot, anyways, right? Nine, 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 nine rounds from one location. So you're not supposed to have to uh, do a standing reload. Right, standing reload should never be required. So you should always be able to run into a position, make your hits, reload, and then all on the move and keep going. One of the last matches I was at, the range officer tossed the stage because there was 10 rounds from one location through a port. So you tell the guy shooting standard, or uh, sorry, classic major with nine rounds that that's somehow fair. He has to let go of the port, reload the gun, open the port, re-engage. How many seconds is that? Mm -hmm. So no, it's nine rounds from one location for a reason. And that was a rule even before classic major, but now it's uber important to follow. I think it's just like a, it makes for more interesting stages anyways, because then you Heck do yeah. a little bit of shooting and you reload on the move and you do your little bit of shooting at your next stage, right? What makes it interesting, Adriel, is all of a sudden, if you stand one location, you can take nine from one location, but they set it up so you're not required to. That one target that pushes you into the 10, 11 uh, realm, if you stand here, you can take it from over here too. Hmm. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So sometimes you will see that appear in an array and guys will start to have a meltdown. And you go, oh, but you're not required to take it from there because you can take it from here as well. Mm -hmm. so yeah. All about the and word then, required. And then you got to game it and that's half the fun. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, this next one here is from Ryan. Hey guys and gal, just guys. Did wait. No, we didn't just read this one. Oh, they're just same opener. Uh, yep. What are my what are my options to reduce the muzzle flip on my MMP9 Pro Core five inch? My dad has the Glock thirty four, and his is a lot less. Well, you could you could get uh, Shadow two. That's that'll, an option. That'll be a lot less muzzle flip because yeah. it 
weighs twice the weight. It's got twice the weight. <laughs> and so, uh, and running nine mil, this thing does not flip a lot. One of the things that you're going to want to do is, um, I mean, it, it depends. If you're shooting a gun game, you'll be you'll, before you do any of the following suggestions. If you're playing IPSC or USPSA or whatever, uh, consult the rules for your division before doing any modifications to your pistol. But if you just want the gun to shoot flat, put a heavy magwell on there. Um, if you can, also put a heavy guide rod in the gun. Go tungsten every time if it's available. You can also reduce your recoil spring. A heavy recoil spring is great for reliability but bad for muzzle flip and dip, especially on the way back, the dip. Ideally, you want the gun to return to uh, what we call zero. So you shoot, <clears throat> muzzle rises up and comes down and stops level. It doesn't come down and keep going down. And that's where a heavy recoil spring, spring can bite you is it actually comes back past zero and dips down. So now your sight is moving up and down before it settles back in the middle. Yeah, the other the other option is if you reload, you could uh, combine that weak uh, that lighter recoil spring with lighter recoiling ammo. So you could use less powder or now again for IPSC, uh, you'll need to make power factor. But if you're not shooting IPSC, if you're shooting three gun, you can run like some real uh, mouse fart loads in your in your nine mil, and that's okay. Just load it till the gun's reliable and can knock down steel if you have to do steel with a pistol. And I'm assuming that. Um, you shot your dad's gun and your gun. And it's not a question of, wow, when my dad shoots his Glock 34, it doesn't recoil. When I shoot my MMP Pro, it recoils. There could be a difference in, in grip and technique there. So, um, yeah. It might be how uh, Ryan grips it as well, right? Maybe he <laughs> grips the Glock 34 better than the than the MMP. Because like they're both polymer striker-fired pistols. They're both in the same weight category. I think the 34, because it's uh, a little bit longer, may actually be a little bit heavier. Um, maybe the 34s had work done to it. So, you know, assuming stock versus stock, you want to get a magwell on the gun, and you want to get a heavy recoil rod in the gun, and you want to reduce the recoil spring weight. Yeah. Cool. Exactly. All right. Want Sounds me to get this one from the whale? Yeah. Hey, guys. I just wanted to give you a quick update on the Desert Tech MDR. I've had it out to the range three times now and ran 10 different types of ammo through it. The manual says to turn the gas valve to six, which is the most open setting for 200 rounds. So put it to six for the first 200. Then you're supposed to dial it back to three and test it from there. I'm about 140 rounds into the break in period, but at six, it will shoot any 308 commercial as well as brown bear and silver bear, you always know <laughs> which are decent quality Russian brands. I was just going to say, you always know that the ammo is Russian if it has an animal name in the title. Uh, <laughs> better than wolf or tool. It does have a problem with 7.62 surplus at that setting though. With, with it trying to rip the empty case, the empty out of the chamber before it's ready, resulting in stuck cases and ripped off rims. But I found it worked pretty well with military loads if I dialed it back to five. I'm guessing it will settle in around four, which seems to be which seems high to me, but is something I can but it's something I can live with if that lets me use surplus stuff I have in uh, I have in it reliably. So who knows? Finish the two hundred though, and then maybe you won't have to run it out of that gas thing to get the seven point six two surplus to go. So given how ammo sensitive this gun is, though, I really wish they had designed a gas regulator that you didn't have to remove the handguard to get at. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I definitely would have went through all 200 before going in and changing it again. That's a pain in the tuchus. I may have to MacGyver something while I'm getting it adjusted. I was also wondering if you guys had heard about the recall FN announced. Oh, no. For the FNS pistols. It seems that if the trigger is pulled while just slightly out of battery, it can fire when it goes back in the battery, even if your finger is off the trigger. I was able to recreate this in both my compact and long slide just by pressing the muzzle slightly against the table, pressing and releasing the trigger, then pulling the muzzle away from the table. As soon as the slide goes back in a battery, you can hear the click on the striker dropping. The only affected this only affects the FNS guns, but it seems to be pretty much all of them. 
I'll put a link to the recall page down below. And one last thing. If you guys think the new High Point pistol is ugly, I can imagine what you thought about the older design. However, the original carbine is still probably the ugliest gun design ever created. I just saw the new one. Yeah, if you never saw one, I'm not sure they have been sold in Canada. I'm including a picture. They have, but unfortunately, there's two strikes against them in Canada. One, they're restricted. And two, we can't use a pistol mag in them because they market it as using their pistol mag. So it's not like you build a carbine around a pistol mag. They didn't do that per se. At least they didn't get through it the same way that the other PCCs that use pistol mags did. So um, if you would like to email the show, you can do so by sending an email to slamfireradio at gmail.com. Shadow Tadro? Hey, hey. What? But I'm the I'm the host. Oh, sorry, man. I got ahead of myself there. Podcast reviews. There that. are none, jackass. That's why I skipped it. You're Jeez, supposed to ask a... people to review us. That's the whole thing. No one if reviews us like on to... podcast apps because it's a pain in the ass. And none uh, more so than Apple. Review us on Facebook then. Go on our Facebook group <laughs> and review us. If you review us, review Trevor separately from the rest of us. Oh, that reminds me. When are you gonna put out that uh, survey? I forgot about what survey I was supposed to do. Oh, you're going to do a survey about do? who's your favorite hosts or an ego question. Oh, yeah. Soul devastating. Yeah. Let's do another one of those. That'd be fun. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Another reason yeah. to drink. Yeah. Ego crushing uh, survey will be coming out shortly. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, do you have any shout outs? I do. To Jeremy Kane. Jeremy is normally watching us live on um youtube but uh jeremy has a uh, a sick dad who's in the hospital and uh according to facebook he's doing uh, much better but he's still not out of the woods yet so jeremy buddy uh i hope your dad gets well soon and uh, we're thinking about you pal yeah definitely um patreon supporters we have 83 uh, if you'd like to become a patreon go over to patreon.com forward slash slam fire radio uh we just finished a special episode on was that Thursday? Uh, our Patreon, we, we actually did it on Sunday. Yeah, it was on the weekend. We're working on the weekends for you, our listeners. That's yep. how much we care. And it was with Gallon, too. So we care a lot. And uh, anyways, that's special for patrons only. So head over to uh, patreon.com and look for Slamfire. And uh, we'll send out a patch when we get them in, which should be shortly here. And a sticker and all that kind of stuff. Please join the CCFR, like us on Facebook, and uh, see you next week. Bye, everybody. So if you have any comments or questions for the show, please send an email to slamfireradio at gmail.com. Now go grab a gun and shoot something. When the talking is over, it's time to get a gun.